So let's talk about that right now. So I'm being a little bit cavalier, but when I talk about anti-seizure meds and I talk about monitoring, I tell the veterinarians that I talk to, just drop this idea of a therapeutic reference interval because it's kind of gotten us in trouble because what will happen is a patient sample will be submitted. Let's say it's anisamide and it's uh, 15 micrograms per mil. And even though we don't have the best therapeutic range, it's still within the expected therapeutic range for dogs and the veterinarian and we'll go, okay, that's great, but my patient's still seizuring, therefore this drug is not working. And I don't think that's how therapeutic reference intervals should work, because I'm going to remind you that a therapeutic reference interval, previously referred to as a therapeutic range, is a population statistic. And you know that, and I know that. And it's presumably based upon the concentrations between which the majority of your patients are going to be expected to respond. So if we have bromide down here and we put in there the therapeutic therapeutic range. And I think that this uh, range of one to three has been pretty well substantiated, both through Dr. Trepanier's studies and our studies. And then it seems to work clinically for our therapeutic drug monitoring um, uh, group. So it, the problem with this is if the patient is still seizuring and they're at three mg per mil, that does not necessarily mean that that patient has failed therapy. Just because it's an outlier, whether it's one or two standard deviations above the population, uh, therapeutic range does not mean this patient needs to give up on that drug, especially if that patient started responding. If it's tolerating the drug, then clearly three weeks per mil is not that patient's therapeutic range, and we can go up higher as long as the patient will tolerate it, and we think there's reason to believe the patient will respond at a higher range. Likewise, if a patient is subtherapeutic and they're responding at 0 0.5 weeks per mil, yeah, it might mean maybe the patient really didn't need that anti-seizure med, but mainly what it means is knock on wood, yay, everybody's happy because this patient is responding at a low concentration and you don't necessarily stop the drug. So for me, a therapeutic range is a great way to kind of show us where we're going, but I'm going to use this data from a paper that was generated for cyclosporin where they tried to show that monitoring was not important for um, uh, for atopy. So this is data that was generated in dogs receiving cyclosporin for atopy. And their point is that the patients are all over um, the, the concentration curve. And yeah, a lot of it's time dependent, but a lot of it is not. And they demonstrated that concentrations did not um, predict the population response. Well, the problem is that that's population. What we're interested in is what is it going to take your patient to respond? So while a therapeutic range is a good kind of target, for example, if your patient is three standard deviations above the therapeutic range, then maybe it's time to give up. If there's been no response, it still is not a good a not, a not a good tactic for veterinarians to use to say, okay, this drug isn't working anymore. So this is how I recommend veterinarians to use therapeutic drug monitoring, and I call it the what's up approach. So certainly with startup, to me, you need to establish a baseline. Now, when is that baseline going to need to be established? When the patient is at steady state with the drug. And so if you have a drug with a long half-life, three to five half-lives, and then ideally after the patient has been um, uh, challenged with whatever negative response. So in this case, let's use seizures. If we know the patient is seizuring once every two weeks, well, you want to wait till the patient gets to steady state and ideally wait for two more weeks. So we know that the patient's been challenged. That's your baseline. That is the patient's therapeutic range. So no longer the patient, uh, the therapeutic reference interval, but the range for that patient. And then if for whatever reason you have to adjust it for baseline, then go ahead and remember to reestablish the baseline because what I'm going to really be interested in, if something has happened to the patient, what has changed? And I can't know if the drug concentrations have changed unless there's a baseline to compare this to. Now, a lot of veterinarians think the best, the main reason to monitor is just to kind of check up and see how things are going. Well, I think that's okay, but you know, that's asking the client to spend a lot of money. And if you've established the baseline and nothing is going on, then I'm not going to push that button and tell your client or tell you to tell your client to spend a hundred bucks. 
Having said that, if this is a patient that is seizuring every three to six months, or if this is a patient that's had a renal transplant or a patient where it's really difficult to control their IBD, then go ahead and monitor that patient proactively at three to six month intervals. Or I think because these patients are going to be on these drugs forever, I think it's a good way to remind your client that their patient is ill and they need to pay attention to what is going on. Not. So as part of a wellness exam, have the monitoring occur. But again, not if your client can't really afford it. To me, the biggest reason to monitor is what I'm going to call the what's up. This is where something has happened. Your patient is no longer responding. You know, now it's seizuring again, or now it's ataxic, or now um, the BUN has gone up. Something has happened and we need to find out if our disease is getting worse or if the drug concentrations have simply changed. And so we could call this tolerance. We could call this pharmacodynamic tolerance. Our patient's no longer responding. In that case, we would expect the drug concentrations to not have changed much well, we could call it pharmacokinetic tolerance. For whatever reason, drug concentrations have changed. Maybe we've been in induction or maybe the client has become non-compliant, or maybe we have a compounded product and things are bad. So I can't really make a decision about what role each of these problems is playing in therapeutic failure, whether you define that as toxicity or um, the disease has come back. I can't make that decision if I don't have baseline. So those are when I encourage the veterinarian to talk to their client about monitoring. So this is a good example. This is the first one I show always when I talk about monitoring, but this was a six-year-old Labrador retriever who's been seizuring for about six months, so a late onset presumed idiopathic epilepsy. He's presenting now because he's having breakthrough cluster seizures. And so when we look at his history, he's been relatively well controlled. But when he was started out on phenobarbital early on, if presumably our target is 15 to 45 micrograms per mil, I've just learned, and Tom can yell at me if I've learned it correctly. But if it's an older, if it's a big dog and an older dog, if it presents with cluster seizures, I get a little bit spazzy and I really want to make sure we've got effective drug concentrations on board. And so this is where the therapeutic range will help me. I'll want to be in the mid to high end therapeutic range to get this animal under control. So the first time they monitored him, they actually were about three megs per kick and his initial concentrations were about 15 micrograms per mil. So I went back to them um, and this was a trough concentration. I said, you know, I'd be more comfortable if you get this dog a little bit higher in the population therapeutic range, given his history. And so they did, they started him at 4.1 mg per kg. And so his trough concentration was 28 micrograms per mil, kind of smack dab in the middle therapeutic range. I'm pretty happy with that. They actually got me a peak in a trough and the half-life was 54 hours. So now he's representing six months later with breakthrough cluster seizures. And the first absolute thing I do is monitor. And when we monitor him, dose is the same, great client. And we've just learned that these clients are some of the best clients in the world. His drug concentrations have dropped by about 50 to 75%. And his half-life is shorter. This is probably a good example of autoinduction. And so that has led me to warn veterinarians that you probably want to remeasure your patients about a month after you have started the drug or adjusted the dose. Um, maybe you want to hold off monitoring phenobarbital the first time around until this induction has potentially occurred. But every time you change the dose, you have to worry about that. So we up the dose again. His new trough is 31 micrograms per mil. And so he has not seizured since that time. So I told you I'd come back to this idea about uh, generics versus pioneers versus compounded. So here's one of the problems that we have. Veterinarians don't get that first of all, compounded drugs are not generic drugs. And so we're trying to teach them that. Uh, but they also don't get that a generic drug's bioequivalency has been established in the target species. And so what you see here is, uh, and I'll, let me go to the next page and I'll, I don't think I need to come back. Let me just show you how many different zanisamide products we have. We have 10 different generic oral zanisamide products. If you look at Keppra, Levetiracetam, we have 15 IV generic 
generic products and I'm not worried about them. Once you get the molecule in the body, it's going to behave the same, but it's the oral bioavailability that is the problem. So we've got, um, we've got 15 oral solutions, 24 immediate releases and 10 extended releases. And while they will have been demonstrated to be bioequivalent in the target species, that is not bioequivalents in dogs or cats. And what happens is the pharmacies and the veterinarians will purchase their newest lot of these generic human drugs based upon cost, not understanding that the bioavailability or bioequivalence that's been demonstrated in people may not translate to their patients. And while we've not done a good job in demonstrating that in veterinary medicine, there was one paper that demonstrated a problem when a dog was trans transferred or received a new generic phenobarbital brand. So I didn't even think it'd be a problem with phenobarbital, but of course it might be. Um, we have one case, and I'm not sure if I've got it pulled up, where one week I had cyclosporin concentrations that were about four times higher than I expected the peak concentrations to be. And it all happened in one week. And so finally I called the practice. I found out that they were prescribing through a pharmacy. I called the pharmacies and it turned out the pharmacies had transitioned to a newer generic product, IVAX, because it was cheaper. And it looked like a lot of pharmacies did. And so I think IVAX bioavailability in dogs is much higher than the other human generics and probably higher than atopica. So this is a reason for monitoring. And what I've tried to do is get veterinarians to tell their clients, to tell their pharmacists, if they are transitioning to a new manufacturer of a generic product to let the client know so there can be a heightened awareness. And so this is, I think, the case where I was just showing you that our drug concentrations, I expected them to be about 1,500 at five mg per kg, and they were 3,800. And so what we ended up doing is with that product, just reducing the dose uh, for those patients. The other thing is a compounded drug. And so I won't go through all the specifics here, but what I'm gonna remind you of is that A, GFI hopefully will stop a lot, GFI 256 will hopefully stop a lot of this, what uh, uh, Gina, uh, Gina um, what's Gina Davis would call um, co compounding manufacturing. So um, manufacturing rather than compounding of drugs, uh, Gigi Davidson, sorry. Um, so hopefully that will put a kibosh on a lot of that that is ongoing, but we still are going to see a lot of compounding ongoing from non-bulk substances. And so the problem is that that increases the risk to the patient. And so one of the points that I make to veterinarians is it would be great. In this case, we actually did a study in cats and we demonstrated that using a 500 milligram compounded extended release product in cats, the curve looked almost exactly the same as a 500 milligram levetiracetam Kepra. So the Pioneer Kepra product in cats. Um, it did not act as an extended release, but at least the time course was almost exactly the same, which implied that they could use that compounded recipe to make a smaller tablet size, so not have to give the 500 milligram tablet. The problem with that, and we've seen a couple of studies, um, Jennifer um, out of um, Illinois has done a couple of studies looking at, uh, Reinhardt, looking at extended release theophylline. It also did not behave as extended release theophylline often in dogs, but it was two different compounded products. And those studies were great because they demonstrated the oral bioavailability of the theophylline extended release was close to 95%, which is a problem because the oral bioavailability of the um, marketed, commercially marketed approved products is only about 30 to 60%. Um, but the bad thing about these studies is while it's great if they're done, they only apply to that individual product. And so once again, anytime a patient's on a compounded product, I think it's important to have monitoring be part of the proactive tool to make sure these patients stay on task. And this is showing you the levetiracetam um, 500 milligram uh, uh, as keprin 500 milligram is compounded in carboxymethacellulose in cats. So um, going forward, this is just a case where that brings that point home. This was a little Yorkie 
that was having all sorts of problems uh, with its seizures. It was already on three drugs, phenobarb, gabapentin, levetiracetam. They added zanisamide to the patient and they did see some response. And so when I see that, I go, okay, maybe that's the drug that's going to make a difference in this patient. Let's pay attention and make sure we get a therapeutic concentration for this patient and then document what that therapeutic concentration was. So this patient was on 10 mg per kg and the concentration in that patient at steady state was 24 micrograms per mil. I suggested we had a lot of wiggle room. Let's get up to 30 to 35 micrograms per mil, maybe a little bit higher. So a 60% increase was suggested and rechecked at two weeks. Um, by the time that sample came back to us in two weeks, this patient was seizuring much more, di more, more difficult. Yeah, much more seizure. I thought, okay, maybe this is one of those rare occurrences where we've actually worsened the seizures. But then when we measured the drug concentrations, they were two micrograms per mil or less. In other words, they were below our limit of quantitation. So we went back to the pharmacy and the veterinarians. We did recheck the patient and we, of course, rechecked our uh, analysis. Uh, we asked the question why this might be happening. Um, owner compliance wasn't the issue. It wasn't a dinky dog. Some of the monitoring we've done, we've demonstrated that when you're dealing with a dinky dog, the dose size that the client has to give is so tiny, 0 0.05 mils, for example, they can't accurately dose each time. And so we've demonstrated through monitoring that drug concentrations bounce around because sometimes the client will give a tenth of a mil, sometimes two tenths of a mil, sometimes 0 0.05 mils. But that was not the problem here. Ultimately, what we did is we analyzed the product and it turns out there's no zanisamide in the product. And so we went back to the pharmacy and this was a PCAP accredited pharmacy. I think their problem was actually the parent compound. Um, we had them remake a new product when they did. This time we measured the zanisinide in there. And while it was 25% less than the label, um, the patient now was indeed responding. You can see now our 10 mg per kg dose got us exactly where I wanted, which was closer to 40 micrograms per mil.